Hey you, welcome to my show. My goal with this video series is to support and cultivate real talent. I want to eliminate trashy art from public spaces that we often see in modern and contemporary art museums and galleries. That's why uh, I've decided to create this video blog. I'll be posting interviews with contemporary artists and art professionals. If you enjoy watching these videos, please feel free to share it. Art belongs to everyone. My guest today is Jesse Lane. Many of you have already seen his beautiful, realistic uh, colored pencil drawings. His dramatic portraits uh, have won many uh, national and international awards, including the world's top award for colored pencil. He is represented by the RJD Gallery in New York. And now let's meet the artist right from his studio in Texas. I'm so happy to meet you here, Jesse. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm excited to do this. Yeah, me too. Wow, you have so many colored pencils. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I used to just have one little box of colored pencils and then um, I just started hoarding them and now I have like a room full of them. <laughs> First of all, I want to congratulate you with the award. You know, it's best of show so how, how does it feel to be the winner oh wow thank you so much um it's just been very cool you know um you you make stuff and you make it for yourself first and foremost but when someone else likes it as well and gives it an honor it's just um extra special to know that you know it meant something to somebody else too and that uh, you know kind of maybe made a small impact in the art world that's pretty cool so uh, yeah it's very exciting I, I mean i am excited for you <laughs> oh thank you yeah it's uh it's really an achievement thank you thank you so much yeah i'm very happy well i'd like to talk about your art obviously i have a few questions in store <laughs> great well the the obvious one is that Whenever we see your work, it's um, we can notice dramatic lighting, like um, lights and darks. And I'm I'm guessing it's coming from Caravaggio um, and his work. And it's interesting to know why why you picked this particular lighting, and also if at any point in time you'll decide to change it to something else, to something different. Yeah, my lighting is inspired by. Caravaggio, um, about 10 years ago now, I uh, decided I wanted to make a piece um, in colored pencil that, uh, you know, it was dark. It was uh, at night and the light was coming in from the side. And I just absolutely fell in love with the way that the human body under light in a dark room, it would create these shapes of light and that one shadow would kind of weave itself throughout the entire image. To me, that was very cool. Like there was design to it and just also the ability to take something that's less important, like maybe in one of my pieces, the wrist runs out of the frame. Um, I can kind of darken that and so I can begin to direct the viewer's attention um, just by making things brighter that are more important and giving them more contrast and then um, making things that are less important to the message of the piece or the composition, making those darker and softer. Uh, that was really interesting to me because I didn't really know before that how to direct the viewer's attention. Mm -hmm. But it's been something very consistent for me. Um, I don't see myself changing with lighting. Um, I do see myself kind of wanting to get more into other color, though, but keeping uh, the lighting, that strong light source, kind of keeping that, um, but just adding more color in, because I love the way that color within, uh, when it's dramatically lit, it can make the color actually feel more intense, and so that's really fascinating to me right now. So how, how do you make your setups? Did you... Uh, do yourself timer or <laughs> you ask 
for someone else to photograph you or how is it that um the pic the drawings of me um i'll start with uh actually i used to just make sketches and show them to people but what i actually figured out is um i'll open my phone the camera and uh, there's that front camera, the selfie mode. You can just record a video um, like that. So I'll take that recording phone and I'll set it down in front of me so I can see what it's recording as I'm doing it. So basically it becomes a mirror that's recording what the mirror sees. And so I'll kind of pose, or as I'm told, it's voguing. <laughs> um, I'll pose with my hands on my face however I'm going to do it. And then I'll have that recording in the video. And then, um, so it's kind of like I pose myself in a mirror camera thing. And then I pause it on that particular frame uh, when I have the pose right. And I'll show like my wife or my dad. And I'll be like, okay, I want like a picture with a better camera of this. And I'll show them like the exact image. Uh, that I want and so that's been very successful for like me getting someone else to take a picture of what's in my head and then I'll also Photoshop on top of that to get it even more how I want it. Um, that's if I'm the model but if someone else is the model sometimes I post for those too but I don't I don't show the model um, but just to get like some ideas going um, or I'll make sketches and I'll just meet with a model and take pictures of them. When I look at your paintings, uh, well, some of them are obviously your self-portrait. I mean, all of them are, but, uh, you know, visually, uh, some of them are your self-portraits, and you're, I'm guessing it's your wife who models, and also you have people of color in, mm -hmm. your, in your work. So could you tell me more about your models and how you yeah. pick, pick them? Yeah, uh, for a long time, I modeled for my own work, and I was very into drawing uh, the male figure, actually, because it was something that was not as prominent in the art world. There are a lot of images of females, but there weren't quite so many of males, and I liked the idea of showing male vulnerability, because it's kind of something men try to hide or, you know, act like it's not there. And so when you see a private moment of like a man struggling, I think it, in a way, it's a little bit more unusual, a little bit more of a private moment in a way just that our society is, you know, eventually I wanted to kind of include other, include females and other hair colors, other skin tones. And so I opened it up. At first it was just me and my wife modeling and I kind of did that, <laughs> exhausted that. It's convenient, right? It's very difficult. To it's very convenient, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I do miss the convenience of it, but you know, I am having fun exploring um, other skin tones and other hair colors. Like I'm drawing uh, red hair in a piece right now, which is something I've wanted to do for years. Uh, African skin, black skin, colored skin. Um, I love the colors within color that appear because I see it in like my own skin tone, for example, but the, those colors are not as prominent, if that makes sense, because my skin is lighter and the, the lighter something is less saturation it has. But I like that when I have a darker skin tone, those colors, they're more mid-tones and you can really see them. And I love what that can do in terms of color and texture, because it's just, I, I put it in, you know, either race that I'm drawing, but it's just so much more visible, I think, in the end result of, you know, a darker skinned piece. So I really like that about it. And just that my artwork can appeal to, you know, um, other races and not just be, uh, you know, people with my own skin tone. So I, I've had fun exploring that for sure. Mm -hmm. I think you are right about the fact that uh, because you draw males, it looks more interesting because I think 95% of paintings are female models. I almost see like even your uh, female faces have some male features in them. I don't know, maybe <laughs> features, but they look uh, different. You know, less mm. fragile, I guess. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I definitely tried to, like, I don't know how to put it, but, like, there, there's a way that people draw images of females, and they kind of try to make them, like, you know, make them look like they have makeup, for example. I, I never want my models to have makeup, and, and I always tell them, like, when I meet them, like, don't have, like, like, don't worry about makeup and then stuff like that. Just like, you know, because I want to capture like the pores in your skin and like, you know, and I kind of do approach it in a very similar way to uh, really it's, it comes down to timelessness, you know, and, and naturally like what's there. That's kind of what I try to capture and not try to be like really pretty necessarily. I think in my underwater pieces, I kind of tend to push a little bit more weightless and, mm -hmm. and pretty and, you know, romantic kind of, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really into, like, the natural look of something, I think, to a certain degree. Yeah. I find that your uh, paintings are very intimate and personal, and mm -hmm. um, most of them are essential. And um, I'd like to know why you decided to focus on people as opposed to uh, drawing objects like a lot of colored pencil artists just do still lives some of them do uh, landscape I think your work is exceptional because uh, you use the light and also you use male models yeah um, for me I began doing art uh, 15 years ago and it began with drawing anime characters and it was just I'll draw the characters that I liked. And so it was it was people for me kind of to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's kind of what just interested me from the time I was a teenager. There did come a point though where I wanted my art to be more about more than just capturing the likeness of a person. Um, like my work, it doesn't really have those kind of portrait portraits that you might think of, like what's on a dollar bill, for example, or it's just a head and shoulders shot kind of a thing. It's it's more to capture, like now take a look at someone a little bit deeper and be like, okay, what is this person really like? Like maybe I can not only capture what someone looks like, but tell a little bit about them or their story or them kind of under the surface as well as like capturing the surface quality of what someone looks like so um yeah i try to now use drawing people to tell stories of like intimate emotion and um you know create a mysterious story where i don't i tell a little bit about something or somebody but i don't tell like the whole story um, you don't know why these people have like water running down their face or why they're like, you know, so inwardly drawn or reflecting or like underwater going through kelp or whatever it is. Um, I, I try not to tell everything, but leave, uh, leave enough room t to keep the viewer coming back to try to figure out but what it is. Like. But do you know yourself why you, you use water? Well, I, what I like about water is um that it one it's timeless so i like mm -hmm. um I, I don't think i have very many drawings that even include like any sort of clothing in them whatever um because i want my drawings to like truly be timeless um but water it's something that's always going to be there but it can do so much and i like things like that where um they can do a lot. So like our hands are very expressive, for example, they can tell a lot of emotional language about what someone's like. I think water is kind of a prop that does the same thing where it can flow very gently down someone's face. It can be like sweat that shows exhaustion. It can be waves that crash into somebody or it can, you can be underwater and be totally immersed in it and be in a weightless romantic world. It can do all those things and like stuff that I haven't even explored yet. And to me, that's really interesting that it's just this one thing that it just, it can do so much. Um, and each of those things kind of tells a different emotional uh, story 
than the other one. But yeah, it's all water. It's all just people and water. It sounds like um, it's an expression of an emotion for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, like definitely. Yeah. You know, when we dream, actually, uh, if you see water in dreams, it also expresses some sort of emotion. Really? I haven't heard that. That's interesting. Um, who taught you the anatomy? Like, are you self-taught? Um, I think who taught me anatomy most would probably be my father. Um, he actually uh, is an artist as well. Um, he the, or He's retired now, but he spent the majority of his career uh, actually in news photography. But before that, he was uh, actually a colored pencil artist, like back in the 70s and 80s. Oh. And he was even in galleries doing uh, colored pencil, like back then when really nobody did it uh, with like wax pastel mixed. But um, he would always do drawings of people. And so he, he taught me anatomy. I also... Uh, um, took life drawing in college and um, went in high school. I went to a private art academy where they taught a lot of anatomy, but really my father has taught me the most about anatomy for sure, I'd say. And just studying the work of Bern Hogarth, uh, he's the artist who drew the original Tarzan, but um, he would kind of create these uh, simplified um, versions of the human body that show kind of where all the muscles are. Yeah, it sounds like your your dad uh, taught you a lot. Definitely, yeah. And he still critiques my work and helps me out with stuff like to this day. It's been really consistent over like the last 15 years because like teachers, you know, at a at a place, at a school, they come and go. But my dad, he's he's been there and I still like show him my work and my wife like the same thing and my mom too sometimes. But um, yeah, I, I show them my work and they give me feedback on it. And I don't always have to like agree with them and take it, but it's always good to have like a second set of eyes or someone else's opinion um, about your work to kind of know, because I create my works like so privately and, and I miss being able to share them with others as I create them because it's something I used to do, but lately it's just been kind of private for me, but it's nice to be able to share it with them. Okay. So there is n no one else with whom you share besides your family members. Is that Pretty much. Sometimes I'll, I'll show like students at my workshops, like here's a sneak peek of, of what I'm working on. But, um, you know, mostly really it's just them, especially for like a critique on it. Mm -hmm. So how do you address criticism if you get any? Like if someone is very critical of your art, like, what do you do? What's your response? Um, overall, I'd say that it's like healthy, you know, to a certain degree. You have to have it balanced. And I, I've, I kind of try to fight myself having that knee jerk reaction of just like, oh, you know, uh. but um, really, I think that it's important because there was a time early on, like maybe the first year that I did art where I was just like, I cannot hear absolutely anything negative about my work. Um, and it kept me from growing. And there was a point where I was like, I really want to reach this level um, of like my, my friends in high school at the time. And I was like, and in order to do that, I, I've got to be emotionally tougher so I can be like, as an artist, I can be stronger. And so, you know, I, I don't have to agree with it, but um, I definitely want to hear it and I want to be awake, aware of it. And um, I, I do seek critique and it doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, like, no matter what you do, not everyone's going to like it. But I think, gosh, I kind of think in a way like that truly valuable critique, it's becoming rare. Like, I think that you know, you can get on the internet and you can get a lot of just harsh, really harsh criti criticism where someone's kind of just envious and trying to tear you down. But I think at the same time, there's a lot of people who um, they really don't want to hurt your feelings. And it's like, in a way, uh, it's kind of like a way to keep someone soft. And I think truly valuable critique, it comes from a place of love and like wanting someone to grow. So I think it's a very valuable thing when you get someone who's, who's critiquing your work with the intention of 
ultimately building you up in the long run by telling you what you may not want to hear in the short term. I think those people are just super valuable. And if you have one of those, like, hang on to them because I think that makes a difference long term. Like, you decide for yourself who is valuable for you or not. Because a lot of times it's just the opinion of someone else who actually doesn't do much art or doesn't get it. Um, yes, and, and also um, i just like to add this, like the, the first thing out of someone who critiques your work should never be like, oh, this looks creepy or this looks bad or this doesn't look good. They shouldn't lead with a criticism. They should lead with like, this looks really good, but if you want to take it to the next level, and then they tell you, like, that's kind of what I respond to best, where it kind of like, I know that it comes from like, a place of love and like, building rather than like, tearing down. So you said you wanted to achieve a certain level in your work. So who was mm -hmm. your, uh, or who is your role model? Yeah, I've had several um, over the last, uh, I, I guess, the last 15 years now. At the beginning, it was like a friend in high school, and then it was like someone in my senior art class in high school who, that was the first time I saw realism in colored pencil where it looked like photographic, and I was like, I have to do that. And then in high school, when I first started out, my role models were the other students at school. And then, um, you know, over time, I began to find other colored pencil artists uh, like Cecile Baird, who's doing really incredible things with light, where I'm not even like a fan of still lifes, but she'll take uh, fruit and she'll actually like backlight it and she'll make it like look transparent and show the colors of it and ma actually make it look like a stained glass window. And to me, that's just really interesting what she's doing with light. Um, also, there's Adrian Stein, who's a uh, very big influence in my work right now. She's um, like the best artist I know in terms of color. And she'll paint these um, women in um, nature, usually with like a lot of leaves and flowers around them. But the way she'll do the color is, I kind of think she's doing it where there's a lot of colors that are similar and then there's like a second group of colors that are very different from that first group of colors. And you get like these different, for example, like if it's like a uh, bunch of like flowers, you know, you have the, the green leaves um, and like the, those are always green and there'll be maybe different types of green, but they're all green. And then you'll have like the flowers, maybe they're purple. You'll have some that are like more red purple and then some that are more blue purple. And then they kind of like, you get this uh, similarity within the purples with a little bit of shift and then, and the green is the same thing, but then you get like this color contrast that happens where, uh, you know, where the purple hits the green, for example. Um, and then all the meanwhile, it's like there's a person in there too. Like that to me is really cool where it's kind of like in this person immersed in a world of color that comes from nature. I really like that idea right now, especially as I'm moving uh, with my work and making more underwater pieces. So mm -hmm. my next piece is going to be, uh, you'll definitely see that influence there. Um, yeah, because I, I, I know the work, and I think the first time I saw it um, in the magazine, probably American Art Collector or mm -hmm. some, some type of magazine, and I was like, wow, who is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's but really I, I actually don't see the connection uh, between you and her work. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it would be fun to see what you do next. Yeah, it's it's something that, um, you know, I think it'll show in my next piece. I don't think it, it really shows in my work yet. Yeah. But um, seeing her work did make me want to get more into color, like in the first place. So I kind of have a couple pieces out now where, um, you know, they're not just monochromatic browns or tans beige from someone's skin. Like I've got jellyfish going on and kelp going on but um next piece i think you'll definitely see that influence there and i don't i don't know that i would necessarily want to like try to make every piece like that or anything i'm not trying to copy but 
it's definitely a big inspiration right now as I move into having more color in my work. Well, when, when I look at your paintings, um, at least that's what I read. I mean, uh, your art expresses um, some fear, some struggle, you know, but at the same time, I can see resilience. Mm -hmm. And um, I also can see that you are kind of moving away from that theme uh, into the theme of love and em embrace. I'd like you to explain like um, what's your current theme is about and like what you want to achieve with that. And um, I'm also interested to know if you always know what you want to express in your uh, art or it's unknown uh, for you until it's mm -hmm. done, for instance. Because a lot of times when I paint, I'm not quite sure what it is, uh, but I know uh, what it is about in the end. So I'm just wondering if it's the same for you or not. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think I know by the end of it what it means. I think I, I kind of come up with these visions, and especially now, like as my work does involve other stuff, just like in addition to people, um, it can be like, okay, maybe this type of fish really uh inspires me or this eel or this jellyfish or whatever it is it's like that's really cool i would i just want to have a picture like that and then i'll be like okay like a jellyfish for example it's very delicate and graceful but it's also dangerous mm -hmm. so i can so those are kind of like the emotional signals kind of like fear but also just very kind of divine beauty in a way at the same time um, you kind of get certain signals, emotional signals based off of, uh, something. Um, but for a long time, I did work that was about, um, personal struggle, inner contemplation, fear, um, to a certain degree. Um, and it began kind of as something that I would include in a piece, but I wasn't trying to really put it at the forefront. And I, as I worked, I kind of wanted to make that emotion more and more intense. And it kind of led my work to become very dark. And um, I think I got to a point where I was like, I don't just want to make work that feels just dark, but I also don't want to kind of pull the emotions back and soften them. So what do I do? And eventually I figured out I can balance the emotions. So as I have made underwater works, they are in a way my darkest pieces, like the, their hands are just totally covering up their, their face um, in them. And they're really just pulled inward in the two I've drawn so far. But um, at the same time, there's that other end of the spectrum emotionally where there's weightlessness and beauty and the idea of love and connection. So, um, you know, I have both of those things going and it's kind of like the viewer can can uh, choose to focus on whichever of those uh, or both. And so um, to me, that's really interesting that a piece can be going so boldly in one direction, but also equally boldly in another direction and kind of have that back and forth of emotion. Because I think that's how life in a way, I think that's how life really is. Um, you know, nothing is a totally perfect experience um, and nothing is all bad either. And you kind of, like life is really not black and white, it's shades of gray. Um, and so just kind of beginning to acknowledge that in a way and exaggerate it and play with it. I think that's uh, really interesting to me just conceptually right now. Did you actually know what your fears were about, or you just began expressing them in art? I think I began expressing them in art just based off of um, being an outcast a lot as a child, um, being bullied a lot as a kid, um, growing up with dyslexia. I just had this kind of massive feeling of inferiority 
uh, in the beginning. And I think I'd kind of moved past it as I was making these works, but it was still going on a lot in my head. Um, and I think I kind of wanted to um, explore that and kind of vent it without talking about it, I guess, uh, just kind of visually storytell it a little bit. And that actually helped me to deal with a lot of those emotions and move past them. And now I'm ready to kind of like um, make works that aren't just about that, but also have, uh, you know, more fun, whimsical stuff. And that's kind of like how my outlook on life has also begun to change is I'm just, I guess, grateful for things that are just so everyday, like how blue the sky is. Like, I just it's really like in a way I'm just, I'm really kind of perplexed by that. Like when I was a teenager and I'd see my mom garden, I'd just be like, eh, whatever, it's just a garden. Like that's such a like sissy hobby or whatever. And now I'm like, oh, those flowers look nice. And you know, I'm just like, I'm appreciating nature and just like, just health even and, and stuff that I used to just kind of just take for granted. And um, so I, I want to have like some positive elements and just especially nature. I'm really beginning to fall more and more in love with nature, which in a way it's kind of like what happened to my dad. I mentioned earlier, he, he drew drawings of people and eventually he got to a point where he was like, what if I drew a picture with nothing in it? And it was just a landscape. I don't think I'm going to do that. But he actually, um, he shifted his work completely away from people and just the landscape. So I think it's a variation possibly of that same, uh, same thing. Wow. Well, I think your art is definitely changing and um, I guess uh, it is an expression of you. So I guess you, um, you moved on in a way. So you overcame your, at least part, I mean, a part of your fear. And mm -hmm. it's good to see it because there is a progression uh, in your mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it shows because that's something I very intentionally uh, pushed for, but also just um, four years ago, I lost uh, five of my best at the time in a, in a gallery fire. And um, this was like right before I made that shift or like kind of right as that shift was becoming of, of more imaginary work. And it was like, whoa, this isn't like something I would ever think would happen. And it's like something kind of surreal affected my life. And I began to kind of see the surrealism within the world we live. And it was a very dark, but at the same time, kind of a, an aha kind of moment. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of look for those, those feelings, I guess, of maybe a little bit of surrealism or where, where it's like something could happen, or I guess imaginative realism. It's, it's something that can happen, but like, what are the odds of that happening? Mm -hmm. And yet it's like happening there within that piece. And that's kind of like what that fire was for me. It was like the odds of that happening were super slim, but then it's like, mm -hmm. it did happen and there it is. So it kind of opened my perception to that a little bit. And so I'm hopefully taking that and doing something good with it, you know, four years later now. I guess it's been enough time for you to move on from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand that your wife is an artist also. Yes. Um, so how does she influence your work or maybe doesn't? I don't know. Is there a particular change uh, to your vision or? Um. A little bit, yeah. She likes doing um, colored pencil <clears throat> of uh, animals where they're very, very colorful. So she'll take like um, a giraffe and she'll be like, what if I made the giraffe kind of like not purple, but have like the ambient lighting in it to be kind of purple. And she'll really just take color and bend it all over the place. And to me, that's something that I'm, you know, kind of looking at and going, okay, now what can I do with color? Where is like color of something, it's not a fixed thing. Um, like, uh, 
I can take something that's one color and make it kind of bend here and there and still look realistic at the same time. Um, to me, that's, I think that's uh, the inspiration there. She also does uh, ceramics as well. So um, it's not just colored pencil. Is she an art teacher? Or? Yeah, she teaches um, at the high school we went to right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so she teaches there. So do you have one student and work together or you're totally separate? Like, <laughs> um, how do you do it? We, we have studios that are next door to each other in our house. Uh, they're just on the, you know, right next to each other, just the wall mm -hmm. between them. I like to, to really just focus. Um, in college, we just work together. Um, but like sometimes I get really into something. I'm just like, I really need to focus on it. Um, so I kind of like having my own room. Yeah, me too. I actually like to be alone. I mean, being <laughs> alone and being lonely are two different things, but I think it's important yeah, yeah. to be alone in the studio, you know, to, I guess not to get distracted by everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what was your, what was the most profound experience in your life that made you who you are today? Is it the fire or maybe something else? Yeah, that's a, that's a very big question. That's a very personal question. But um, for me, I think that the biggest experience in terms of like shaping my life may have been, um, it, it doesn't sound like much, but it hit me so hard at the time. Uh, I was 15 years old and I mentioned having dyslexia. I had also been told like by my art teacher the year before that I was the worst artist in the class. Um, well, I got so, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. And so I just, I was, I guess, very vulnerable. I didn't really have anything great that I was excelling at, but um, I did do art kind of very off and on. It, it wasn't regularly at all, but I was like, you know, I, I was kind of doing it here and there. And um, I was watching my friend draw one day and I'd never seen, like I'd seen my friend's work, but I'd never actually watched my friend draw. And they took like an anime character and they just sketched it out in 15 minutes and it was like that looked exactly like it and i'd never seen anyone do that before especially like in just 15 minutes mm -hmm. and i was just so jealous <laughs> as a as a 15 year old kid and something inside of me just snapped where i was like i need to have something i'm good at i want to be able to do this and i i'd never tried it anything before in my life. I'd always looked for the easy way out of something and made excuses, just not tried. And that just for the first time, it made me feel like determined to do something. And um, I didn't even think I could get better at drawing, but I was just like, it, it affected me so much that I was like, I have to just try and see what happens. And so um, I went home that day and I drew until I went to bed and then I woke up the next day and I drew um, that day and then like that by the afternoon the next day I spent I don't know maybe six to eight hours on this thing in my sketchbook but I was amazed at like just how much better that looked than what I was trying to draw in like 20-30 minutes um, and I was like okay if I push myself I can achieve so much more like really my talent was at the same level but just out of pushing myself I was like that became really interesting to me and also just that emotion felt so good it felt really validating to just feel proud of myself and just how hard I worked and it's not that I even reached that level that my friend drew it was like nothing close to that but it was better than anything I'd ever drawn and so for me that idea of like out doing your best effort, always putting your best foot forward with, with the things that matter to you. You can't do it with everything, but with something like art that truly matters to you, that became kind of my life's goal in a way. And 
so every colored pencil piece I've done, it's like I am always hoping to outdo the previous one. I can't always do it, but I can always control like the effort I bring to it, the enthusiasm I bring to something. And so that just really changed my life to go from a kid who, who never tried at something, never had anything they were great at. And just holding on to that, that kind of personal mission in a way, it's led me to become a professional artist eventually and uh, help, you know, be one of the artists that helps pioneer colored pencil. And that's just, to me, incredible that I've been able to do that just by sticking with something um, like that for so long. So, like, let's say, between anime and your current body of work, what was in between? Like, what did you do? <laughs> what did you draw in between those two? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I began with anime drawings of anime characters, people, and it later shifted into uh, realism because as I progressed through high school, that's what the students were doing. And I was like, I want to, you know, I want to fit in and be like them and be able to do what they do. So I began drawing realism. I didn't even like, like it as much as anime at first, but I was like, you know, just because they're doing it, I'll do it. And um, then, um, you know, I kind of left anime behind eventually after a few years. Uh, I began kind of focusing on realism. I even did a few like Western cowboy <laughs> pieces uh, for a little while. And then um, in college, I drew a picture. It was like a self portrait and I was like sorting through laundry and I had my shirt off and I was like, okay, I really like drawing the skin tone because it had more skin to draw on it. And I was like, I really like this. Let me just see what I can do with like drawings of skin tone. So I began doing, drawings of like a bunch of <laughs> shirtless pictures of myself <laughs> um, for, a, for a while. And then, um, you know, focused in, I was like, wait, I can draw the most skin tone if I just fill the, fill the page with something like the head. And so, um, and, and really get an explore color and texture. So I began doing that. Um, but I actually went to college for animation. And so uh, there was a lot that, didn't help me with my art, but I think the element of storytelling and creating a mood within a scene, I think that translated into my art very well. And also learning like Photoshop, because that's a digital art form. That was, that's been very important um, for me as a colored pencil artist. Um, and so, yeah, kind of, kind of led me to portraits. And then um, that's kind of the first thing people know my work for. And now we're seeing it uh, transition into more imaginary stuff in a way, um, which is kind of weird, because anime, in a way, it's, it is a little bit more uh, imaginary in a way, and it's kind of like my artwork in a realistic sense, it's kind of, it's, it's far from anime, but it's kind of going a little bit back more to a whimsical kind of thing like anime is, so. So did you become cool in high school when you started <laughs> drawing? <laughs> no. um, Gosh, I certainly didn't think I was at the time, but my wife, because we've been together since we were in high school, um, she was like, yeah, you, you were pretty cool in high school, but I mean, she's my wife. So. <laughs> I, I do think, of in, like eventually I did make my way into the, um, uh, the AP drawing class. So I was like in there with the best. I mean, I think that's cool. <laughs> um, so... I guess eventually I, that's such a weird question. <laughs> I was, I was cool enough by the end of it, but, okay. but then oddly enough, I was like, you know what matters to me more than being cool or like having a bunch of friends is cause there was a time I actually felt like I fit in. I was like, art kind of matters to me more than like how many friends I have. And so I actually kind of began to just really focus in on art. And it's kind of weird. Cause like I, in the beginning I did art, to have friends. I've never really talked about this, but in the beginning I did art to have friends. And then after I got friends, I was like, I kind of like my art. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a few very, very good friends, but I don't, I'm not one of those people who's just like, oh yeah, I know like 50 people in, yeah. in real life, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
I don't know. Whenever I work on my art, I there is a there is often a chance when I get frustrated and I need to overcome that frustration. Like, uh, do you ever get frustrated when you draw? And uh, how do you solve it? Like, how do you overcome it? Uh, yeah. Um, the finish line, basically. <laughs> hit the finish line, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, this is this is a great question because a lot of people talk about, like, you should love what you do and, you know, like, do art because you love it. Express, like, what's within. And it all comes from this place of, like, it mattering to the artist and I think that's like a very romantic part of making art I think it's also a very real part of making art but it's not the entire truth of making art like I've had times you know some of my pieces have taken over a thousand hours mm -hmm. there was like four weeks straight for example that I was just drawing water drops one little water drop over and over again until I had like eventually four thousand something water drops <laughs> It was not fun. Like, I only love water drops so much at that point. But it's kind of like a hybrid car in a way where uh, it's got that, that, that gasoline, but then it's got that battery, and it runs off of both. And so for me, the joy of making art is one of two things, and that won't always be there. Um, I've drawn hair sometimes for like a month and a half straight, and it's, it's like I like it for three weeks, but I don't like it after a certain point as much. Um, and it doesn't make sense to just move on to another area of the piece. So for me, I, I kind of dig within and focus on more like something external with my art. And I know that may sound like really kind of shallow to say or whatever, but like, what are my art goals? Like, you know, winning the CP award, the top prize in colored pencil, that's been a huge goal of mine for like six years. So I'll be like, you know, I will, I want to, you know, put my best foot forward at like entering this contest um, or like make something great for the gallery or I want my art to, you know, hopefully be in this magazine someday. And I'll begin to think about like these other goals I have and I'll, it'll kind of become like this thing that motivates me again to keep pushing when the, when the muse itself, it, when I've kind of exhausted that, I'll tap, I'll kind of tap just into that drive and that grit. And that can be really fun. Like, it's not even about necessarily whether or not you achieve that goal. I mean, sometimes it is, but it's, it's also just fun to see how far you can, you can push yourself. Um, I actually had a piece uh, where I spent 61 hours just straight in the chair drawing a black background and, and I won't get into it, but I had to do it all in one sitting. And like, that's like three, that's like, Oh, someone's work week and a half, like straight through. <laughs> Um, and uh, that's something that definitely pushed me through that to just kind of like hang in there um, as I did that. And at the end of it, I was just really proud of like being able to bring that out of myself. So it's not always going to be fun, but you know, the, the fun of making art that should come first if it can, but you know, realistically it's, it's not always there. Um, and being a professional artist, I've, I've kind of, uh, referred to my studio sometimes to myself. It's like it's beautiful. It's got all these pencils and that's great because it is my prison It's like the most beautiful prison and I'm chained to this desk whether I like it or not if I want to be a professional artist So I'm not you know, hopefully I like it and most days I do um, and that's part of why I've actually like made my studio so elaborately decorative is I've made it a place that I want to spend time in like I just like being in here and I've noticed like a difference in my enthusiasm for my work than when I first started it was just like a desk in the corner of a room um, I feel like just more joy in sitting in this room so that's also helped me is just making your studio as enjoyable as possible if you can so how attached are you to your work, I mean, you spend so many days, weeks on, on this, and uh, is it difficult for you to part, or you're okay just you know, letting it go? It used to be very hard for me to think of the idea of selling my work, and then I, uh, four years ago, I joined, or yeah, I joined RJD Gallery, and then like six months later, I lost uh, 
five pieces in the fire and I'd also sold a few pieces. So um, I let go of like really all but like five of my works. And um, I think that really stretched me and hit me just super hard at the time. Um, I was only like 25 when that happened. But um, yeah, uh, because of that, it's, become, it's made the idea of selling my work like so much easier and better. And I also got my work scanned to where it looks um, like 90% at least like the original. And so um, it's, it's kind of hard to miss it when you still have the, the full size print of it there, but also just knowing that it's, it's with someone who uh, cherishes it. It's like so much better than like it was destroyed in this fire or whatever. Um, and I kind of, I, I go into making a piece now with the idea of, uh, it, it's kind of got, it's a moment in time and it's gonna pass. It, it's got kind of its lifespan here with me and then it's going to be out in the world and I'll, but it's okay because I'll have something else that I'm working on that I'll be uh, really excited about. So it, it really doesn't bother me um, at this point, the idea of selling my work, I think just because of those experiences. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the process that's important and then yeah. kind of, loses its importance and, you know, yeah whatever happens happens <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and i think you kind of as you as you make more pieces too if that just in itself becomes easier um I, before i went professional i didn't have a whole bunch of colored pencil pieces i would actually only make like one a year in the summer because i was doing all this animation based stuff or whatever um and so it was like i just didn't have other other works it's in a way, it's kind of like, this is my, my firstborn child or something. Not that firstborn children should be the most loved, but I didn't have anything else yet. So it was just, yeah, but now it's getting easier as I, as I make more pieces. And you're right, it is definitely about the experiences and the joys and even struggles of uh, making the pieces, for sure. So why did you uh, quit animation? I mean, I, I'm assuming it didn't hold your interest. Why is that? Um, a lot of people would probably assume that <laughs> I was, okay, so I was 18 when I chose to go to school for animation, but I don't regret it, even though I didn't really like animation. Um, my wife and I started high school and she said, uh, I'm going to Texas A&M to study animation. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll come. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I would, I would do, um, I would just try to pass all the animation classes and then I would focus like 80% of my efforts on the one drawing class or the one thing that I thought would help me with my colored pencil artwork. Um, and I did get to study in Italy like um, as part of that. So like it definitely did have some value and I learned Photoshop there. And I can't even animate at this point, but uh, yeah, that's that's why I picked it. But I don't regret it because I mean, she and I we made it through that, and we're married now, uh, twelve years, uh, twelve years together now. So, and then I still get to be a professional artist. So, <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I made it work. Yeah. Wh whom would you like to thank? Uh, for your experiences, for your achievement? Yeah, I think, I think um, first and foremost, it would be my parents, um, especially my dad. My mom has done so much for me. Um, but my dad, uh, he, you know, both my parents, they didn't, like when I was a teenager, they didn't be like, go get this minimum wage job somewhere. They're, they they said, we want to give you the freedom to, uh, you know, figure out what you want to do in life and basically give you freedom um, rather than go make not much money <laughs> uh, working somewhere. And I think that was really helpful because it helped me to, like, that was when I really began to push towards making art. But also my dad, he, you know, he's believed in me to progress and and he's believing me enough to like invest his time within me 
um, and help me with my work. And um, he's dealt with a lot of my, I guess, uh, a lot of my struggles. Um, you know, we, we've talked so much about like the fire when that happened and, um, you know, just when I'm artistically felt like I'm going through a rut. Um, and, and he's just the fact that he's always been there for 15 years. And I know I could call him up right now and be like, Hey, I need a critique on my drawing. He'd be like, he'd drop what he was doing and be like, yeah, sure. Like, let's do it. And, um, my mom for, um, you know, helping me to go from, um, someone who had talent as an artist and like help figuring out like, okay, what shows go in or like, what are good galleries and, um, you know, help figuring out, I guess, the art and business side of art. And she's been like super, super on board. Like, I think she's like my biggest cheerleader, um, like over my art career. Um, and then my wife too, for, um, you know, just, uh, always believing in me and, um, encouraging me with my work and never being like, Oh, this is uh, stupid or whatever. Um, and uh, also my um, high school art teacher, uh, Jim Kitchen, he, um, at the very beginning of AP art, uh, I was like, everyone came in and showed their work at, on like the first day. And I was, I, I went to him after school that day. I was like, I'm not good enough to be here. And I, I really felt like that would have been the end of me as an artist almost. And he was like, Jesse, from what I saw today, I think you can be here. Like, stick it out. Like, just give me till Christmas. And I, I, and it was like, I just didn't want to let him down. I don't think I've really told this story before, but I was like, I didn't think I could do it. But I was like, I just can't look him in the eye and be like, no, I can't. Like, I can't let him down. And so I just like buckled up and I was like, fine. If I have to be here, I'll work like twice as hard or whatever and and like I made it happen and I feel like that year was a really pivotal point for me as an artist where I was I began to like go from t doing it regularly to like okay now now I'm serious about this like how how good can I really get and I think that helped me to take my drive to the next level um so okay. yeah I would say those people for sure mm -hmm. So let's say if you go back in time, who would, whom would you like to meet? If you go back, I went back in time. Yeah. Um, gosh, I, I would normally like, I think most people would say like, you know, someone they've lost, in, but I haven't really lost anyone like that close to me yet. Um, I would say Caravaggio, but I know that he actually like hated his contemporaries and he'd probably try to kill me. So, um, <laughs> like he'd challenge people to duels and, and yeah, uh, I got kicked. <laughs> um, I think I would just, just off the top of my head, I think maybe Michelangelo, um, and it's not that I, I think he's like that great of a painter which I know that offends some people because people are like he's the greatest I mean I think that he's a sharp mind for his time but I don't think he's the like the greatest um he's a remarkable sculptor but what I would want to know is like you pushed yourself on that Sistine Chapel like that like that took years like like because I've talked about like my work takes me up to a thousand hours or a little more sometimes but like that took years like how many thousand hours did that take and like he just he pushed himself he didn't have like you know he wasn't just sitting in a nice chair in his air-conditioned studio when he did that like mm -hmm. that took some serious drive so I would I would want to know like kind of how he pushed himself across that finish line and just what he told himself and I also think he's like also probably a a little bit of a what's the word not witty necessarily maybe a witty guy but he um I, when i went to italy there's this sculpture um out somewhere i don't remember it maybe it may have been rome i'm not sure 
But then in the wall of the building next to that sculpture, and the sculpture wasn't by him, Michelangelo, there's this face where Michelangelo went and he carved, he chiseled out in, into the side of the building what he thought their face should have looked like. <laughs> so he was like, I, I don't know if this critique was asked for, but he was like just also so sure of himself. Um, I mean, maybe this artist asked for it, but probably not. You don't just carve into the side of a building <laughs> to show something like that. But um, I mean, that, that takes some serious confidence in your work. Like, but obviously a certain amount of that confidence, you know, led him to be great at what he does. And I do think that self-confidence and self-doubt are two of the most important things an artist can have, and you need both simultaneously. Um, so yeah, I think that would be really interesting to kind of hear a little bit about that. Let's move forward. Who would you like to meet today? <sighs> From with my COVID, with with COVID, just about anybody <laughs> at this point. Um, I don't really know. Um, I think it'd be cool to meet Adrian Stein um, and just talk more about color. Um, and Casey Ba, uh, he does really remarkable compositions mm -hmm. and he does portrait work with charcoal and paint. Um, he's also so just super successful. So I think it'd be cool to um, pick his brain. But uh, th that's kind of what comes to me at the top of my head. So what's your hobby outside art? Like, what do you do? I I'm guessing exercise. Yeah, I, I like to exercise. Um, I've got a gym that I set up in my house uh, for COVID that I've been using a lot lately. Um, so yeah, probably just that and taking walks sometimes here and there. Um, and just being outside is great. Really anything that gets me out of my studio or gets me moving is a great balance for being in my studio so much. Do you have anything else you'd like to share? Why? Or maybe why colored pencil? I don't know. Why? <laughs> why colored pencil? <laughs> why not oil paint? <laughs> yeah, I like I like colored pencil because of the precision it has, but um, it, it's really um, a precise medium, and it does things more easily than paint with for detail work. I think, and it does have like its disadvantage to paint. But um, I like that people kind of underestimate it and it catches them off guard and surprises them um, and kind of makes them look at uh, an art form or an art medium in a different way um, and just says, wow, I didn't, it takes something that people think is so ordinary and makes them say, wow, I didn't know that tool could do that. Um, to me, that's really interesting when I can make that happen for somebody. Well, Jesse, you have a lot of talent, and um, I'm just, uh, I'm excited to see your progress and um, to see a new work, and I wish you a lot of success and happiness in art and in life, and I'm very grateful you decided to participate in my show. Uh, I think it's an excellent start, I mean, I'll continue. Um, doing the recording. I'm just very uh, grateful that you want to share, want to share your, your experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Really appreciate and, uh, it. Hopefully, uh, I'll see you uh, again, maybe in a few months or maybe in a year, and we'll do another interview. Yeah, anytime. Um, this has been great. So, yeah. Uh, anytime you want to have me back on, um, yeah, definitely just let me know. Okay. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to share it. If um, you'd like to be featured on my video podcast in the future, um, send me one link with your portfolio and I'll take a look. Also, if you're a gallery owner, an art critic, or you work in the contemporary art scene, I'll be happy to hear from you too. 
Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.